Good day, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Rainfall, rainfall. Where for art thou, rainfall? Raindrops used to come a plenty regular, not just now and again. But then there used to be tall trees here, mostly clear felled now for economic gains. So it says, if you look, you can even read it in the book published in 1996. So, it wasn't a bad guess, eh? 1996. 23 years ago. And I was switched on sufficiently to know that forests make their own rainfall. So, given the fact that 23 years ago I was sufficiently certain of the connection between forests and rainfall as to have been literally eloquently waxing in rhyme, publishing poetry on the topic. How did that come to be? Hmm? Well, you see, I'm the sort of hillbilly who grew up around here. I feel like I came here in 1882 when my father's grandfather brought the family DNA to the district. The last time he visited me up here about five years ago, my half-brother let slip the fact that he, he knew this ridge from his teenagehood because this here, the place I pay rates on, that's where our grandfather used to take him in the 1950s looking for charcoal to run the blacksmith's forge at Wharton's Garage. So I'm, for a white fella, yeah, I'm living on the ancestral homelands. And when I was in primary school, all this, the New England tablelands, it used to be a, a wet sclerophyll forest. It was drying out when I was in primary school. By the time I was in early high school, this was a sclerophyll forest. 50 kilometres east of here, it was a rainforest when I was in primary school. And the rainforest was starting to dry out. And by the time I was in high school, it was more of a, a wet sclerophyll forest and this had become a sclerophyll. When I bought the title deed for this place 30 years ago, it was pretty much changing from a wet sclerophyll, uh, sorry, from a sclerophyll forest to a dry sclerophyll forest. And now the rains have failed two years in a row. Last year, we missed 30% of our annual rainfall. This year, we might have missed 60%. And it's pretty much what I've been expecting because when I was in high school, I got shipped out of town. I got shipped a hundred miles south of Sydney to a boarding school and there they took us on an excursion to a place called Robertson and at Robertson they had, it might have been 10 acres, four hectares of remaining temperate rainforest. And I mean, there was a gate in the fence around this thing. It was a square surveyed block just on the outskirts of town. And if you went three meters inside the fence, you couldn't see the sky because there was a triple canopy rainforest over your head with buttress roots and Tarzan vines and almost nothing growing in the leaf litter and mulch on the floor of the forest because there was not enough light. And the story was that when the white colonists showed up there in the very early 1800s, the whole countryside was covered in a temperate rainforest. And because the rainfall was so high and the soil seemed pretty rich, they cut it all down for dairy farming. And apparently it took 60 years after they cut down the rainforest 
for the rainfall to stabilise and it stabilised at 40% of what it used to be before they cut down the rainforest. And at Robertson there was this one little remnant subsisting on the orographic fog from the sea breeze hitting the escarpment and pushing the air up 2,000 feet and forming a cloud and that bit was still there. And I thought about it and I thought about the way in my lifetime, even as a 16 year old, the rainfall of this New England Tablelands area had fallen off and was still falling off and how they stopped logging the escarpment for cedar trees and each cedar tree was good for about a thousand litres a day in evapotranspiration. They stopped logging the cedar trees in the, the eastern escarpment in 1963. So by 76, I'd seen that the rainfall was still dropping after they'd stopped logging the coastal forest strip because it had already been logged. First for the cedar and then for everything else. During the 1950s in Glen Innes, there was so much rainfall that where the baby boomers used to line up to catch the school buses, the Lions Club had to put in concrete footpaths to stop them from sinking into their ankles in the mud by standing in the same place every day. The footpaths are still there as an artefact, not only to how the road use has changed, but also to how much rain we used to get and we don't get anymore. In the early 1990s, back when I lived in a house with a television before I left the missus, there was a program come on where somebody had pointed out that they'd been measuring the isotopes of the oxygen in the rain falling successively further from the coast. And they determined that only for about the first 50 kilometers inland from the coast does the rain come from water that evaporated into air from the ocean. Once you get further than 50 kilometres inland, most of the rain has water that evaporated up out of a forest and they can tell that by looking at the isotopes of the oxygen, perhaps the hydrogen too, but I'm pretty sure it's oxygen isotopes. And they determined that the way rain gets to happen hundreds of kilometres inland is that it it comes in from the coast and it rains on the ground and then the next day the sun evaporates it and a sea breeze pushes everything about 50 to 100 kilometres inland every day. And it, the same water goes up and down five or seven times before it finally gets out near the Darling River. And it was suggested back in the early 1990s that what went wrong in Australia to create the vast arid central desert zone was that 40 odd thousand years ago when the first people colonised the northwest coast and not the first people to get there but the first people to colonise it they used fire to farm the megafauna or to hunt the megafauna and they burnt off the coastal trees and they shut off the rainfall pump and that came across the news and I took it in and thought about it and correlated it to what I'd seen in the 1970s of the rainforest remnant down at Robertson, south of Sydney, when they, yeah, they had a bit of rainforest still there. And then it all sort of went quiet. And where well, we've got Australia's terminal drought chewing us around at the moment. But I recently had a bit of a, a slowdown in my YouTube use. On the one hand, I got a battery problem. So I, I can't charge the battery while it's in the phone. I've got a universal battery charger but it means I, I regularly have to stop YouTubing in order to charge the battery so I'm, I'm getting to wade through the backlog of new scientist magazines and ah oh, maybe a month ago there was a new scientist magazine that has a really really informative article that sews together all the pieces of everything that I've been talking about so consider this to have been the overture so this little look at the first week in November, the New Scientist magazine article, commencing on page 40, titled Rivers in the Sky.
We talk a lot about deforestation's role in climate change, but its impact on Earth's water recycling system is just as critical, finds Fred Pearce. Gerhard Moss is a bush pilot in the swashbuckling tradition. Born in the UK and raised in Switzerland, he had flown twice around the world in his single-engine plane before he set out on a new journey to track rain clouds across the Amazon in his adopted home of Brazil. Local scientists had an idea that the forests of the Amazon were the continent's biggest rainmakers, that most of the moisture in the clouds had been taken up and recycled back into the air five or six times by its 400 billion or so trees. Take away the trees, reasoned biologists such as Antonio Nobre, then of the National Institute of Amazonian Research in Manaus, and the rains would die. The Amazon basin would turn to desert. But with the rainforest largely a black hole for meteorological data, the idea was just that until they hired Moss to equip his plane to collect water vapour. Moss's flights over the Amazon a decade ago tracked the moisture-laden South American low-level jet, a concentrated airflow that Nobre called a flying river. On one trip, Moss followed the jet for eight days from northeast to southwest across the rainforest before tracking it east to Sao Paulo, the biggest city in South Africa. His data showed that the jet carried enough water in a day to supply the 20 million inhabitants of the metropolis for almost four months. One day, four months worth of water. Isotopic analysis revealed that most of that water had been generated by the rainforest. The role of forests in the world's water supplies was starting to come into focus. Alarm bells would soon be ringing. We now know that flying rivers traverse the globe and influence rainfall over huge distances, and we are learning that forests play a key role in supplying them, which means that in much of the world, the loss of the moisture recycling from deforestation is a more imminent threat even than global warming. As Moss buzzed the Amazon's flying river, Dominic Sparklin was at a computer screen across the Atlantic at the University of Leeds in the UK. He was analysing meteorological data to tease out any relationship between rainfall and the amount of forest the air masses it fell from had passed over during the previous 10 days. His findings too were dramatic. Across most of the continental tropics, from the Amazon to the Congo Basin to Borneo, air coming from forests delivered more than twice as much rain as air that had passed over deforested areas. Of course, moist winds coming off the ocean usually bring rain, but the two investigators had trashed the long-held view that evaporation from the oceans is directly responsible for nearly all our precipitation. They showed that coastal winds rapidly dry out as they travel inland, unless there are forests to recycle the rain and keep the air moist. Spracklin says tropical forests recycle almost twice as much moisture as grassland. Quote, people once said that rainforests had high rainfall because they were located in wet parts of the world. Now it looks like forests usually make their own rainfall, says Douglas Scheel a forest scientist at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Vegetation on land, and especially forests, is the dominant source of the moisture that falls as rain over huge continental areas. The air flows that move that moisture are as big in terms of the water they carry as surface rivers and travel even longer distances. What emerges, says hydrologist Ian Wang Erlandsson of Stockholm University, Sweden, is nothing less than, quote, a new image of the global hydrological cycle, unquote. The implications are stark. Deforestation is already reducing rainfall in large parts of the world. Large-scale forest loss could cut regional precipitation by up to 40%. Spracklin reported in a paper last year. In the Amazon, even partial deforestation would probably reduce rainfall by more than a fifth in the dry season, not just in the rainforest itself, but for thousands of kilometres downwind too, across the soya and sugar plantations of southern Brazil and on into Paraguay, Bolivia, Uruguay and Argentina. Tropical forests are usually cleared to increase the land available for agriculture. Two Gs and a capital K. The irony is that deforestation may ultimately make farming untenable over even larger areas. 
far from rain, quote, following the plough, unquote, as a 19th century adage had it, it seems the plough is more often the prelude to lost rains. When first published a decade ago, few climate scientists took much notice of either Moss's data or Spracklin's modelling. Most researchers saw the climatic impacts of deforestation only in terms of extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But that perception is changing fast, says Wang Erlandson. It seems that large-scale clearing of vegetation by humans has created deserts before. Take the now arid interior of Australia. It was much wetter until around 45,000 years ago. Today's desert depressions were huge permanent lakes, kept full by strong and wet monsoon rains. Lake Eyre, also known as Kaditanda, back then extended to around 10,000 square kilometres, but is now usually a dry, salt-encrusted plain. Global climate factors can't explain the dramatic drying, says Gifford Miller at the University of Colorado. Quote, the only variable that changed is humans colonised the continent, unquote. He and Australian colleagues argue that the most plausible explanation is hunters burning bush to round up their megafauna prey. The loss of vegetation shut down moisture recycling and weakened the penetration of monsoon moisture into the continental interior, he says. As a result today, quote, Precipitation diminishes rapidly inland to less than 300 millimetres within a few hundred kilometres of the coast. That interpretation offers a stark warning for other continents, not least South America. Australians, however, appear not to have learned the lesson. Much of the continent remains a hotspot for deforestation that may explain continuing declines in rainfall. In the past half century, some 130,000 square kilometres of forest along the western coast south of Perth has been replaced by wheat fields. While rainfall along the coast has remained stable, there has been a 20% decline inland, leaving reservoirs that supply Perth parched says Jorg Imberger, former director of the Centre for Water Research at the University of Western Australia. Why does the loss of forest hold such sway over rainfall? Hydrologically speaking, trees are giant water fountains. A single tree typically transpires hundreds of litres of water a day. Transpiration is a process by which growing trees take water from the ground and release it into the atmosphere through their leaves. What has only recently become clear is that transpiration is a major source of water to the atmosphere and is responsible for around half of all precipitation, up to 60,000 cubic kilometres of water a year, says Scott Jashenko at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Quote, transpiration moves more water than all the world's rivers combined, unquote, he says. Indeed, some physicists say that the condensation of moisture in clouds above transpiring forests creates air pressure changes that draw in air and strengthen the winds that take the moisture inland. This idea, known as the biotic pump, has its detractors, but Deborah Lawrence at the University of Virginia says it suggests another reason why even small-scale deforestation, if it occurs in coastal areas, could disrupt the movement of moisture inland. Scheele says a weakened pump might explain declining surface winds seen across many land areas in recent times. Clearly, in a world where forests are being lost and fresh water is in ever shorter supply, tracking atmospheric moisture matters. The first global attempt at this was made by Ruud van der Ed at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He combined meteorological data with a computer model of atmospheric moisture flow to figure out the main source and sink regions for moisture and the roots of the main flying rivers that transport it. Key source regions include Western North America, Eastern Africa, Europe, Western Asia, India, and above all, the Brazilian Amazon. Flying rivers often take this water long distances. Around 70% of the water in the River Plate Basin, which stretches from southern Brazil through Bolivia, Paraguay and Uruguay to Buenos Aires in Argentina, 
comes from the from transpiration in the Amazon. China gets the moisture for over 80% of its rain from far to the west in the forests of Siberia and Scandinavia, a journey involving several stages of water recycling by trees and taking six months or more. Quote, the China finding was among my first and it was a real eye-opener, unquote, says Van, Van, Van der Ent. Quote, we learned in high school that rainfall comes from the oceans. China is next to an ocean, yet most of its rainfall is moisture recycled from the land far to the west. Transpiration from forests may be crucial for relieving droughts and ending dry seasons, says Wang Erlandson. When there is no rain, evaporation from soils and transpiration from shallow rooted grasses and crops ceases, but trees tap roots trees' roots tap into water deep underground, so trees keep transpiring, providing moisture to relieve drought downwind. No trees means more drought. This isn't just speculation. In the Amazon, the dry seasons are getting drier, says Jessica Baker at the University of Leeds, UK, and longer. When, where forests have been placed with cattle pasture and soya fields, they last an extra month. The worry is that beyond the tipping point, some models suggest a 20 to 25% loss of forest could be critical for the Amazon. Tree loss could turn the climate into one where only savanna grassland thrives. The Amazon is unlikely to be alone. In Southeast Asia, deforestation has removed half of Borneo's forests in the past half century. That has coincided with declining rainfall with both trends accelerating since the 1970s. Quote, watersheds with more than 15% forest loss had a more than 15% reduction in rainfall, unquote, compared with those with intact forests, says Clive McAlpine of the University of Queensland, Australia. The Central African region, more dependent on moisture recycling than the Amazon, has seen a persistent decline in rainfall coinciding with forest loss. The Congo rainforest transpires water that provides vital rains for many arid regions to the north, including the Ethiopian highlands, <clears throat> the main source of the Nile, and its loss would drastically diminish the world's longest river. It might also be the last straw for the Sahel region on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert, which Lawrence says may already have begun been deprived of rainfall by the past destruction of the rainforest in coastal West Africa. These days we talk a lot about how deforestation will release carbon dioxide and accelerate global climate change. Quite right. But its impact on moisture recycling may also disrupt weather systems on an intercontinental scale. Ronnie Asivar at the University of Miami in Florida has shown that the Amazon deforestation is likely to damage rainfall in the U.S. Midwest Grain Belt, and others have shown that it could halve the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Quote, none of this should be a surprise, unquote, says Avisa. Quote, we know you get similar long-distance effects from El Nino events in the Pacific, which arise from changes in evaporation quite similar to those caused by deforestation, unquote. Even so, the links between deforestation and the drying of landscapes aren't automatic. There are sometimes trade-offs. If trees extract water from soils and pour it into the air, there is less left to flow into local rivers. Downwind rainfall may be at the expense of downstream flows. Quote, floods, close bracket. That is one reason why deforestation can increase flood risks. Downwind rainfall may be at the expense of downstream flows. That's why deforestation can increase floods. Yeah, okay. Also, some crops commonly grown on deforested land, such as palm oil and rubber, can transpire more than the trees they replace. The expanse of water flooding, irrigated fields, may have such the, much the same effect, counteracting deforestation. One modelling study reckoned that up to 40% of rainfall in parts of East Africa today comes from water evaporating from the irrigated expanses of India. Try that again. 
Up to 40% of the rainfall in parts of East Africa today comes from water evaporating from the irrigated expanses of India. So when their Japanese Honda pump sucks their wells dry and they can't irrigate their rice paddy three times a year, Africa's going to get a drought. Another found that the moisture lost from the irrigated Central Valley in California contributes 30% of the flow of the Colorado River to the east, from where much of it is pumped back down canals to irrigate crops in other parts of California. Mega city drought. So how should the world respond to this new hydrology? Clearly, preventing deforestation in key regions that supply water to the rivers of moisture-laden air that bring rain is vital. Water supplies in some of the world's megacities, including Shanghai, Karaki, Sao Paulo and Delhi, depend on moisture recycling from sources in distant countries. Some researchers believe they know enough to target forest risk restoration in places that will increase rainfall in water stress places far downwind. Wai Wang at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany calls it quote smart reforestation. She says planting 70,000 square kilometres of extra forest in the Bolivian Amazon could deliver 600 million cubic metres of extra rain annually to a river supplying the country's largest city, Santa Cruz one of Latin America's fastest growing urban areas. The city's authorities are considering a trial, but Scheele warns that, quote, if we assume we can just replace natural forest with plantations and irrigation, we are playing a dangerous game with a system we don't yet fully understand, unquote. What may really be required is a new way of managing the world's water, one that recognises that rivers on the ground depend on those in the sky. Currently, rivers are managed individually within their river basins as if the rainfall was a given. But in reality, these basins are interconnected by flying rivers. Land use in one river basin is critical to water supply in another. Water management needs to reflect that. In a world running short of water, this matters now. During a serious drought in 2015, Sao Paulo almost ran out of water. The largest reservoir supplying the most populous city in the Western Hemisphere was down to its last 5%. And city authorities blamed deforestation in the Amazon. It was a close call. For now, what happens in the Amazon still seems far away for most people in cities like Sao Paulo. But that may soon change. Rivers in the sky. Rainfall, rainfall. Wherefore art thou rainfall? Raindrops used to come a-plenty regular. Not just now and again. But then there used to be tall trees here. Mostly clear fell now for economic gain. So said the fool on the hill 23 years ago, because I'm not as silly as I look, let alone as silly as you all look. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.